Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for All About Android is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash Android. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code AAA to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. And by Hover. Finding the perfect domain name is incredibly easy with Hover. Go to hover.com slash AAA and save 10% off your first purchase. Hello, welcome to another episode of All About Android. This is episode number 318, recorded on Tuesday, May 16th, 2017, where your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Jason Howell. I'm Ron Richards. How's it going, Ron? It's great, Jason, because it is the most wonderful time of year. It is Google oh, I.O. Eve. Wonderful time of the year. It's Chris, Chris, Christmas in May. It's the time of year that we, we the, the whole new world will be open to us uh, later this week. Yeah, so. there's really just, <laughs> there's like a few points throughout the year that you can you can mark on your calendar and look forward to and know that there's big stuff happening, right? Google I.O., there's the usually the hardware stuff that happens October-ish. I feel like I'm missing something. I'm sure there's another one in there somewhere. I don't know yep. what it would be, but these are two major, major times. And so. maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe CES, maybe, you know, beginning of the year. But yeah. uh, no, but for this, oh, this my, is, this is the, this Mobile this, World this, Congress. This, yeah. Well, right. Yeah. But this is the best time of the year. And, and there's really only one way to get ready for Google I.O., right, Jason? That's true. Uh, this, yeah. we, we added it up. It took uh, at least two hours to add up all the episodes, <laughs> all the years, consecutive years that Mike Wolfson, uh, Google developer, expert, and author of an upcoming book called Remote Teamwork. You're back for the fifth year in a row, Michael. Yes. Thank you for putting the staff to work to <laughs> determine that. I know it took a lot of effort. and We shut everything else down. It was very important to, fig- to get to the bottom of it. But it's great to have you back. It's awesome to be back. This is the tradition, my favorite tradition of I.O., for yeah. sure. So we, we totally look forward so to it as to well. Back. And you always bring awesome guests with you. That, that is definitely the case today as well. Don Felker, also Google developer expert, but uh, author, co-host of the Fragmented podcast yes. for Android developers. Yes, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, I've definitely been following your work online. And I will, I will admit, when I listen to Fragmented, most of it go, flies over my head. Because I'm not a developer. That's all right, though. Yeah, but but it's still a good listen. And it's great. It's great kind of like deep dive into a lot of the stuff. Like we we touch on developer topics yeah. here. You really get into the nitty gritty. We do. We we dive really deep down into the nuts and bolts inside of Android. The or my co-host Kasha Gopal and I mm-hmm. try to make sure that we provide our day to day experiences as Android developers to other Android developers and have great guests on as well, like you and yeah. Mike is also a repeat mm-hmm. guest on there as well. Many uh, times. See, it I all, get around. It all works. <laughs> <laughs> and how long has been, uh, Fragmented been going on now? Uh, we've been doing a little over two years now. Nice. All right. How many episodes? Oh, we think we just released last Monday, episode 83. Oh, ah, so you're awesome. nearing that 100 point. We are. We're trying to catch up to you guys. A cake. <laughs> We're trying get, to get a cake or a cake. whatever the dessert is by that time. I'm sure the dessert will be known by the time mm, yes. episode 100 yes. rolls around. Uh, and tell us a little bit about your book, uh, Mike. Um, well, I'm just getting started writing a book about uh, working remotely. Um, I've been re- working remote, as has Dawn, for mm-hmm. years and years, and I want to write a book that helps people understand from both a worker and a manager uh, environment some tics and te- tips and techniques to kind of uh, how to be more effective working remotely. Um, my intention is to collect a team of authors to write it with me so that we can then develop this remote teamwork together, write the book together, and kind of gather all of our group uh thoughts together. So nice. We're just in the initial stages, but it's an exciting project and something that's really I'm passionate about. So All right on. Excellent. Uh, people Ooh. people kind of follow the progress at your site, Mike Wolfson. Uh, yeah, that's a good place for now. Right on. Uh, remote teamwork.org is, is also, um, that's the official URL, but it's uh, not quite there yet. So yeah, as, things, as how things go. Yep. Absolutely. This stuff <laughs> takes time, people. 
Jeez. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. Obviously, we're going to discuss what we expect at Google I.O. There's even late breaking news around that. This is we're talking right before the show. The eve of I.O. is usually when like leaks start to happen where we start to actually understand thanks to leaks what's going to be presented the next day. So it's kind of like spoiling Christmas a little bit. We don't know a whole bunch at this point, so we won't spoil your Christmas for you uh, that much anyways. We'll we're going to talk about Project Treble, which is very interesting. Uh, the new HTC U11 that was announced last night. Uh, wherefore art thou? Seamless updates. Seriously. Uh, Netflix targeting unlocked and root users and a whole lot more. I think this first segment constitutes news, so let's do it. Google I.O. is coming up, which means we've got an extra large sized Android news. <laughs> it's true. We, we gave extra time for this because this always takes the, a, a large chunk of the pre-IO episode. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm sorry, Ron, that you will not be there. Um, listen, we're we're gonna we're gonna be positive about it. You know, okay. I, I'm I'm here on, in New York. It's not as easy just to shoot that a Mountain View as it once was. <laughs> I'm gonna watch from home. All will be well. So, <laughs> all right. Well, we'll t we'll tell you all about it. And, sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. Know, we'll, we'll hey, talk. listen. I, I'll tell you one thing. I won't be missing that hot parking lot sun in Mountain View out there in the uh, in the in the tent city in the parking lot of the shoreline. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, OK, so we were all the three of us here at the table were all there last year. Did you learn the lesson the hard way that you need to use sunscreen? So I wasn't there last year. Oh, I'm sorry. But I did learn the lesson. And before Mike picked me up today, I bought sunscreen at the store. Excellent. <laughs> all right. That's what you need to do. I'm realizing right now I did not pack it. I'm going to have to pick some up. What about you? I'm sure you're covered. So I am from Phoenix, Arizona, where oh, we have true. ridiculous <laughs> amounts of Never sun. Mind. So your little California sun doesn't even like phase your puny me. Sun. Yes. Wow. That's true. All right. Fine. You win. Um, all right. Well, I, I put together, a, well, at least I sat down to put together a big list of things that I could, you know, log as far as what we could potentially expect or look forward to. And then Mike, you passed along. Oh, hey, wait, you saw this, right? And it was the link to none other than Ron Amadio at Ars Technica's exhaustive handiwork. Yeah as he does usually for this sort of thing. He wrote a book, not really an actual book, but a book's worth of information about what could possibly happen at this year's IO. And he has a really great track record. So uh, so we have a decent list to kind of pick through here. Um, we could go one, on one, one by one, or if there's anything that you guys are like super duper excited about, we could start with that. No, is there anything jumping, like before we dive into the list, is there anything that you've been really looking forward to out of this IO? Well, what I really, really hope for, we talked about when we first got in here, is a um, VR headset uh, that doesn't require a phone. Uh, okay. What, what was the term? Uh, I, know, well, I know we jumped. It, I think this is jumping way ahead. No, no, it, does, it doesn't matter. A standalone headset. Standalone VR headset. That's what I hope and dream for out of this I.O. Really? That's like your top of the list request. Wow. I think Design. so, actually. Are you really big into VR right now? I'm not so into VR. I do think there's quite a bit of future for it, but I think the nature of having a standalone VR headset that probably could have a really good range of vision and stuff well, um, hope, yeah. would be a lot better product. And I think that a good product is uh, something that VR needs. Uh, not that it doesn't exist, but you know, the Vive is very expensive. Yeah. Um, also requires a, hard, yeah. a hardware, all those things. So I think a standalone headset that just works and that has a really good field of vision and is fast enough, doesn't overheat. Um, I mean, that may be asking a lot, but, um, <laughs> you know, These maybe all two, two, of two out of three listen, would be good, but. Listen, this is Google I.O. Eve. You can wish for anything you want now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't been disappointed yet. It's oh, okay. okay. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out, so, so right before the show, uh, Variety posted basically a report. It's, it's a follow-up to a Wall Street Journal report that happened, I think, early last year that uh, and and in the lead up to last year's IO, so we were having the same discussion last year, which is, is there going to be a standalone VR headset? And now it's kind of reemerged where Google has been working on a supposedly a standalone VR headset, whatever that means, not tied to a computer, not powered by your smartphone with as a daydream device, but an actual standalone headset. I'm trying to envision like a. What is that? Is it a mobile VR that doesn't require, so it's mobile VR, quality VR that doesn't require your phone? And B, why? 
because well, Google think, already has the mobile VR. Like what? Well, I, th- I think to answer, I mean, I think to answer the why, the answer the why first, uh, untethering a VR without requiring a smartphone or requiring any hookup to any other hardware kind of frees it up, right? It like it makes it much more mobile is more of a reality, and then it's also a lot more accessible if you just buy the headset and it just works, and you don't need anything else. You don't need a phone to snap it into, mm-hmm. or you don't need a computer to plug it into. Um, but that said, I don't know how they do that from a technology standpoint where, where does the processor sit? I mean, like how big is that pack? That's about, I mean, like, I don't yeah. I, like from a hardware standpoint, I don't see how they build that given what the computing power that we have now without a phone or a tether to a desktop. Well, how is the uh, hardware any different than it just being a phone now, yeah. but the form factor is just subtly That's different or just built out. in. Yeah. So I think fair, where the advantage could come in and actually I learned this last year here at the Twit studio when I tried on the Vive. Uh, the Vive has a really good field of vision. You don't see any black anywhere. You don't see any light mm-hmm. coming in, uh, which you do see with the uh, Daydream, obviously the cardboard. So, like, if you could you create see it less with the Gear VR, but you still see it. Yeah, right. um, mm-hmm. and the Vive is uh, stands ahead of the game, I think, because of that field of vision. Mm-hmm. So, if you build a custom hardware that you're not trying to shoehorn a phone into, maybe you can like get that field of vision proper. Um, but but so I think but it's just also, a phone inside of a piece of hardware, but that it just comes complete as one unit and not right. right. And I, I, I agree I agree with you. The the field of vision and the keeping the black you know, keeping light out and that sort of thing is hugely important. But like do the phone processors pack enough power to compete with an Oculus or a Vive? Yeah. Yeah, because that that's always been the complaint about the phone based VR, right? right? Is that the, you're limited by the processing power there. So yeah, I don't know. Like it's, I'm just You'd hope you'd hope that if sorry to cut you off, uh, oh, no, you, no, you'd no. hope that if Google is doing something like this, it's in between the two, or you'd expect that it would be in between the two. I'd hope that it is not. Eh, it's just like your smartphone VR, except it doesn't require your phone. It's a dedicated device. Then it's kind of it's a total meh. Um, uh-huh. I would love to see yeah. some sort of positional tracking if that's integrated in here. And it's not like Google is a stranger to this. They have Project Tango. Tango shows off that capability really well. And I keep going back to this, but I would love for them to take what they're doing with VR and sandwich it together with the positional tracking capabilities of something like Tango. Throw that in a in a standalone headset. I think you totally got something. Yeah, then you can start messing with AR as well. Yeah. And like that would be that'd pretty be sweet. Pretty. Are, sweet. are you at all interested in VR stuff? I have uh, only spent time with cardboard, so my uh, experience is very limited, limited. and not yeah. uh, hasn't been the greatest, to be 100 percent honest. I mean, cardboard's cardboard's like a taste. It you is know? a taste, it, and uh, and then once you get into the, some of the other things, and especially when you get into the the premium mm-hmm. experiences like Oculus and uh, and um, HTC Vive, that that can be really eye opening. But have you guys played with a lot of? VR devices or, or, or headsets or what? Yeah, I mean we've had we've had pretty much all of the major ones through here at the studio, and yeah, they're really they're really a lot of fun. Here's, as, as here's a, a, go ahead, Ron. I was just gonna say here's a question though. I haven't played with enough, as much VR as you have, Jason, and you guys have at the studio. But is it possible to build a VR headset that is not tethered to a desktop, but but has got Wi-Fi? Not tethered to a desktop, but has but Wi-Fi. But, but powered by Wi-Fi, you know, or powered via like a local network. You know, oh, like a, so, a wireless. So, you know, so solution. passing passing audio and video yeah. through mm, wirelessly. I mean, I don't see why not. You can you can stream PlayStation games to a portable device via yeah. Wi-Fi. You know, based right. on their own uh, setting. Um, I guess you just have to justify why. Well, and, and you would still require if you're in Google's case. You'd yeah. still then be requiring someone to have a computer to power the, the VR device. So you'd have right. to explain why why you do that. That might be a challenge, but maybe there's a significant reason for it. So anyways, that's one of the things. <laughs> VR is one of the things, and uh, apparently Variety thinks that we we have that to look forward to. Um, well, which is funny because Variety reporting on Google I.O. Like, I find that very interesting. I mean, like, I get it that, like, we're all about clicks and stuff like that, but, like, Variety? I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I understand Variety <laughs> on, on the VR tip. Sure, like, an entertainment yeah, standpoint. Yeah, yeah the, I guess so. The kind of so. content aspect. Um <laughs> Because it's in the chat room, I'll go ahead and mention it. Anyone think we're going to finally see Allo kind of break through in some other way than it already has? That's like maybe like a desktop version of it? I don't know. This is a hard sell because there's so many messaging apps that are already out there. I have to convince not myself, but also everyone else I talk to yeah. to also get on that other platform. And if someone else is already using SMS, which is already is usually the, the global leader in it, 
how am I going to convince them to go over to something else? Maybe they already have Facebook Messenger or right. WhatsApp or whatever. It's just a hard sell, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Have you been using it very much, Mike? Uh, I did use Allo just to talk to my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, I could only get one person to join me. Right. Um, yeah. And I loved Allo. It's such a great messaging tool, but uh, you know, just one person in my network does Challenge. not make a successful, you know, messaging platform. Yep. I would not surprise me if we see another messaging platform from Google announced. <laughs> Are you serious? They seem to, no. they seem no. to like these quite a bit and. I mean, the rumor is that they were are going to consolidate to Hangouts right. um, with their new uh, Hangouts Meet, I think they call it. And uh, on the enterprise that, side, they're really yeah. they're really positioning Hangouts to be more of like an a Slack solution. competitor. Yeah. They're having mm -hmm. some threading. They're adding some threading and things. Um, yeah. So um, I I I like Allo. We use Allo between Ron, Flo, and myself. Flo, by the way, I, we, we didn't even mention it up at the top. Obviously, Flo is not here. She is at a very important dinner uh, <laughs> down south uh, around Google I.O., uh, so she could not make it tonight, but uh, she will, of course, be back next week, and I'm sure you know, we'll have lots of She'll, she'll have lots to say about I.O., I'm sure. But, um, she wanted to be here, no, but she couldn't. <laughs> no, but aloe is, aloe is fun, uh, but literally the only people I use Allo with are you, Jason, Flo, and my niece who's on an iPad and doesn't have a phone number, so she can't be on WhatsApp with the rest of the family. Yeah, yeah. So I set, her, I set her up on Allo, and that, you know, that's all I do with it. And, you know, if anything, if they're going to announce, I know there's some rumors of it, um, uh, Duo being built into Allo, you know, which makes sense, you know, instead of why is Duo a separate, you know, kind of thing, build it all into one kind of platform. Mm -hmm. That That's kind of interesting. But if they do not roll out a desktop version, then what Then what is the point? A year later or, or, or you know, less than a year. But, you know, with all this time, how hard is it to build a desktop app version of it or a web-based app? Uh, because that's truly what, that's for me. That's what makes WhatsApp so great is that I can just have it up on my desktop all day. I don't need to be texting on my phone. I can use that as a chat app across any any device. Mm -hmm. uh, limiting to the mobile is just such a limiting factor with Allo. Yeah, kind of made it at least in the short term a non-starter. Um, yep. And and I'm not sure that Google necessarily assumed that it would would be a non-starter. You know, I think they assumed that a lot of the feature set would be enough to pull people yep. over, but it just turns out that everybody, God, we're splintered into a million different directions it's, in messaging. We've talked about it on the show many times, so we don't need to don't get me started. too deep or too don't, deep. Don't get me started, Ron loves man. talking about this. I, <laughs> I, will, I will start, I will get back up on that soapbox and I will yell. I'm gonna take uh, away the soapbox. We've got too many other things to talk about. Uh, Copulous Paste as a potential feature for Android O. Have you guys heard about this? It's basically the idea. Oh, sorry. How does that work? How does that work? Copulous paste. I keep hearing that they've thrown about, and that the, blows my mind. The idea from what I understand is, say you're in a web browser on your phone, and you're searching for a movie theater. You're like, oh, this movie's playing at this movie theater. And then you go into a messaging app to like tell your friend that it's playing at a movie theater. One of the, at least in the case of Gboard, copulous paste could possibly work in the sense that when you pull up Gboard, one of your suggestions just automatically is the name of that place or the location of that place. So that instead of having to remember to copy the name of the place and go over there or copy the location, it like understands the context of what you're doing on your phone and offers it up to you later as a way to make it easier for you to transfer information from one point to another. So, and it also seemed like the apps themselves have hooks into the API so that they could populate that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm running the movie app, I can say, Oh, this guy's probably going to want a, uh, Address Store the this theater. in the, in yeah, the yeah. temporary so, copulous paste. Right. So the app itself can populate that, you know, based on what information it thinks is valuable. So that seems pretty useful. Yeah. If I can pre populate, you know, what the user's going to probably need. Right. As long as it's, yeah. I mean, I feel like sometimes we see these things that are like, we're we're detecting how you are going to use your phone or yeah. what apps you're going to want to do. And we're going to present it for you and make your life easier. And it'll, in the end, it doesn't make your life any easier. Yeah, that's it hard. It kind of complicates it. And mm -hmm. people start getting freaked out about you know, everyone's watching what Wait you're doing. Wait a minute. Doing. See? Yeah. Now suddenly it's watching everything that I browse yeah. and, and put it, why did it put it up there later? I didn't tell it to do that. Yeah, yeah that, mm -hmm. uh, they'll have to answer questions around that. I'm sure there'll be other Android O, like we know a lot about Android O already. There's going to be um, the official... Uh, kind of roll out from what I understand of the dev preview um, to beta system. Mm -hmm. So they stopped that with the NuGet beta where you can kind of sign up and have it automatically OTA to you. That's going to transfer over to Android O. And so then you take the features that we already know about Android O, talked about that many times, 
I'm sure there's going to be at least a couple that we don't know oh, of yeah. yet, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, and we'll discover more about that as we go in. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Android TV <laughs> and Wear features, apparently. We don't know what features, but there are, there are events or discussions that are built around that that say, you know, take a look at the new features. So those would be tied into Android O. Wrong someone enough. someone tweeted at me uh, the schedule and uh, that Android TV actually had a, uh, a you know a, a, a time set aside in the schedule for like discussing Android TV and somebody asked me if I was excited for it and I was like listen man they do this every year <laughs> every every year there's an Android TV session and every year they talk about how nothing's going on with Android TV <laughs> so um, I'll be excited I mean and where we're gonna talk about it later in the show but where continues to be kind of a, you know, not a, a non-important kind of thing. And I doubt Android TV will get much love. Uh, it's at the point now where I'm just like, I'm setting the lowest expectation whatsoever for any Android TV stuff. Yeah. And you don't have Android TV at home, right? You're, you're, I don't, I'm, I'm Chromecast. Like Chromecast. Yeah. yeah. My, my, yeah, my TV has a Chromecast built in and they recently updated the YouTube TV app. So now it works. That was a bug and then oh. it wasn't working with smartcast TVs, but now it works. So, okay. Yeah. Nice. And I love that's, it. I love it. Good. Development. But, uh, um, I'm excited for so to, to, to chime in here. Uh, it was a year ago at last year's I/O that they announced the Google Home, mm -hmm. right? And and that was our first introduction to Assistant. And then Assistant rolled out in the fall. We got Google Home. It is safe to say that it has been a a very positive impact in my life as well as I believe yours. I don't know if the guys, you know, Don and Michael, if you guys have Google Homes, but uh, I'm excited to see what the next uh, phase of Google Home will be. Whether there's going to be any response to the recent announcements, which were interestingly interestingly timed by Amazon to mm -hmm. be ahead of Google I/O. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Amazon Echo updates, uh, I'll be curious to see if there's a going to be a new Google Home, perhaps one with uh, with a screen, much like the uh, Echo Show that recently launched. Uh, I don't know. What do you guys What do you guys think about Google Home uh, in terms of a product? Okay, go I'll it. go. So yes, I think you're <laughs> totally on right, Ron. I do think we will see the next version of Home. Um, I mean, they're really going to be pushing like Assistant mm -hmm. and AI. Um, yeah, so AI I, and assistant big on their big list time. I mean, that's year. like that's I think thing. what is really going to be their the, what they're really going to be pushing. So I really do think we'll see a second version of Home because last year Home was announced, but they didn't have it ready, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, right? Well, and in fact, they did have that wonderful promotional video, though, if you remember, yes. that's super cheesy. Um, rumor has it that the <laughs> unit they were showing on stage was just an empty box, like last year. On, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, Probably. So you know, but I think this year it's ready, um, and so. They'll get people excited about it. I, yeah. I expect that we'll see Home with a lot more additional functionality. Maybe, I mean, I would love to see Sonos integration, but, um, yeah. you know, they recently introduced Hue integration lights. So I think we'll see a lot more Home automation tied into Home and maybe a new device. Mm -hmm. uh, I do don't you know. think that, do we think it'll be a new device with Wi-Fi built in? Like the router, a combination of the Puck router I, I and a Google rumor. Home? I don't think huh? so. Um, God, I could totally see that. I don't know if I see that for now, but I can totally maybe see Maybe long term. Those items I, I could converging. see that converging sometime. I just think that maybe that's like two products in one and like, so neither of them are going to be good. Mm. Um, I, I have Wi-Fi at home, Google Wi-Fi, and it's awesome. I love it. Yeah. Um, I would advocate for it and hope that everybody starts using it, but I don't think they're going to combine those two things yet. That I would love for them to though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it per, to me, it makes perfect sense. You want, once you have a home, once you have a Google Home <laughs> and, and a home to put the Google Home in, um, you realize and, and you use it enough, you want more because you realize the combined power of having yep. these in different rooms mm -hmm. is actually pretty impressive. Same goes for Wi-Fi. You have one versus you have multiples in different rooms, you know, that increases your connectivity. Yep. It seems like a no brainer to me to just combine them. It does know? make a lot of I, sense. If they can I gotta, use the additional home automation, if they can replace, you know, there's a, the Samsung, I think it's Smart Things is Smart what it things. is. Mm -hmm. If they can do that same type of thing with Google Home, I think it's going to have a, a much larger impact overall. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there looking for a new home automation system. Uh, and nothing is really out there yet. And I think it's right for the taking. And, and hopefully mm -hmm. Google Home comes in. Yeah. And and they've and they've da they've danced with that idea a couple of years ago at I/O we saw that Google Home not Google Home but remember that Google House that whole animation yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know all that sort of stuff we never really saw that dream realized and as somebody who's got Google Home and Samsung Smart Things which Smart Things is a great product you know it was it, it can be a little bit of a hassle to set up Smart Things and connect it to home it'd be nice to have it all just work under yes. one whole thing and and also those protocols that are running a lot of those um, home based devices 
whether it's Samsung or or we think or not we things, but the you know the other ones. Um, I, there's one with a W. I forget what it is, but you know the whole Zigbee protocol mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like those are due for a next generation kind of jump up, and I think Google is the type of people that could 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 drive that. Um, but ultimately, I just want them to do a new Google Home device that has something different, whether it's Wi-Fi or a screen or some other thing, so I can justify buying it, so I can put the original Google Home in the bedroom and have a second Google Home in a living room, uh, because I, that per, uh, purchasing a second Google Home did not get approved uh, by the head of household here, okay. so she was not All into right. it. So, yeah. <laughs> then, do you agree that you want a lot of them? Like, yes. yeah, the, the, you really yeah. do want multiple well, – what, what it, happens it, is it was, my daughter – Takes the home physically, unplugs it, and takes it all no over way. the house. Oh, really? Home. I'd love to well, have one she's in got, everywhere. So that's a mobile home, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> nice. Mobile nice. Home. All right. Well, it's funny because my girlfriend said, she's like, if we put the Google Home in the bedroom, could we use it as an alarm clock? I was like, yeah, we totally could. Yeah. She's like, oh, so we should move it in there. I was like, well, we can get a second one. And she just looked at me and shook her head. <laughs> uh, but what's funny is that like my sister has been – they have uh, the Amazon Echo – and they've been buying the little Echo Dot to put in each of my niece's bedrooms, and they use that as their alarm clock, and they have the whole functionality in that little hockey puck. I think if there's a a lower-cost hockey puck-esque Amazon Echo Dot-like Google Home thing that enables that multi-room installation, that would be interesting as well, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the one challenge for you, though, Ron, is once the new one comes out and you get it, then you have to figure out, like, what is this – what is the – uh, the room that doesn't deserve the the latest and greatest. Uh, home. Luckily what enough, is the room that I poison with my <laughs> old home? Luckily enough, we're in a small New York uh, apartment, so it really doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> the, it's, the room it's, is it's, the room that you're in because right. there's really only much, a yeah, couple. It's just basically two rooms, and, and you can see <laughs> the other room from the other. It's, it's fine, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We're going to hear about, well, we are, we talked a little bit about Assistant. Obviously, AI is huge. If you look through the, the events list and the talks, mm -hmm. I mean, AI is all over the map. It's all about, you know, bringing it, you know, giving developers access to uh, AI through the cloud and 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 broadening that out assistant uh, is uh, we have reports that is probably going to hit ios uh so why which which i'm having i was thinking about this what is the benefit it like obviously the benefit to google is that they bring assistant everywhere um god i don't know how to phrase this question like is there a benefit to having assistant on your phone when you already have it, like on a Google Home, like Google Home works with iOS. So why would an iOS user want Assistant in their pocket? They may not have a home. Like I don't have one in my house. Okay. So I use it on my phone, but my wife actually does use an iPhone. Uh -huh. And so she could possibly benefit from it quite a bit. Has she seen you using Assistant and been like, hmm. She just makes fun of me for talking to my phone. That's all. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So she's probably not the target audience for, for Assistant. <laughs> Well, a great example of this is one of my coworkers is is an iOS user, and the news that I that assistant the leaked news that I assistant was was coming to iOS just without even no prompting or hesitation, he was like, I would totally use this over Siri. Okay. Oh, well, like yeah. I think right. I think iOS user I think iOS users see more value with a Google driven AI assistant than what Siri has done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, and that's that's been a lot of kind of the uh, the coverage that it's gotten as well is that Siri is. Not it is inferior in many ways to what Assistant is able to do, and kind of how Google manages kind of their their just their knowledge graph in a very usable conversational way, which is mm -hmm. what you really want out of a voice assistant. Um, hardware, more down the hardware tip. I've seen some rumors that point to you know Pixel sequels, but I would find it really strange if we heard about that at Google I/O. Yeah. yeah, right. Like that. It that's usually of, like October. And the it is. Pixel. Phones themselves are not all that old, even no. at this point. They're, you know, like yeah. they're still working on those. Yeah, the cycle of phones, I think, turnover is not like it used to be. Like a year or even two now on a phone is even yep. like a yep. normal life cycle, not mm -hmm. six months or nine months. Mm -hmm. What about a Nexus Seven? So tablet? that could be right. We haven't seen a new yeah. a new tablet in a long time. Yeah, I mean, the, the Pixel C is the last one, um, and that's I think a couple years old now at this point. At least two years old. I would welcome a, a new seven-inch tablet. Yeah, it's, it's a reliable one. That's not one that's just kind of clunky. Meh. Yeah, yeah. It's 
God, everybody loved the Nexus 7. Ron, you were a big fan of the Nexus 7, right? Love the Nexus 7. Love the Nexus 9. I love my Nexus 9. I would glad, you know, like I'm I, every t- every day I open up my Nexus 9 and it's not a brick is like I, I I'm thankful, right? So I'm just wait, <laughs> I'm waiting for the Agreed. day that it's just going to, you know, that the the support is going to stop and everything's going to die, but I think I think we're due, you know, say what you will about the tablet market being dead. You know, even iPads are dead. I mean, like the the tablets are just not selling the way they have been because really there hasn't been a lot of innovation on the development side. To give us that killer app other than the kindle app to read on a tablet i mean it's even me like i mainly use my tablet to read books and to watch tv at the gym that's it i don't do a lot of you know computing on it but i think we're due for a new model we're due for a new nexus type or pixel like you know not a convertible laptop you know kind of solution but a straight up tablet although so. we could hear about some sort of a convertible solution you know there's always yep. this resurgent rumor around andromeda uh, some mm-hmm. sort of combination of Android and Chrome OS. Of course, we had a friend of the show, Hiroshi Lockheimer, on the show uh, last year, and he basically kind of said that that wasn't going to happen, more or less, but yet these rumors still persist. I think as of March, there were AOSP references to Andromeda, and so there is always this potential that there is some sort of a new take on a convertible uh, uh device device made for uh, you know people who need to, you know, productive environments you know i think it's important to note that a lot of folks out there who use these these tablets and, and chromebooks are also are heavily in education yeah and there's a, there's a huge market in education for folks that may want to use these seven inch tablets and and for example my daughter's school are full of chromebooks mm-hmm. and smaller tablets and i think though there's probably a big market there that that google's looking at because they already have a huge footprint inside yeah, of do. the education area. Absolutely. Speaking, yeah. speaking of education, uh, a quick anecdote, not related to Google I.O., but uh, this past weekend, my niece uh, turned 14, and so I got her a Asus uh, Chromebook uh, because, you know, she's been sharing, you know, they had one laptop for the family, and, you know, so it's like she's going to be in high school next year. Let's get her a laptop. I got her a, a, the, uh, I forget what model, Asus Chromebook, but really nice. And we opened flip? it up. We, uh, no, it's not the flip. I didn't get her the flip. I got her the traditional, uh, the three something. The, I forget what model it is. Um, it, it had a red cover. Um, but anyway. Um, oh, C300. And, yeah, the C300. That's the one I got it for. Yeah. Uh, great 13-inch 13, 13 screen, you know, like a um, uh, good processor. Like it was great. It was, you know, good, good, nice little device. We opened it up. We set it up. God bless her heart. I opened up Chrome and I was like, all right, what website do you want to go to? And she's like, oh, Let's go. I want to log into my school account and go to Google Classroom because I want to check on the my, the assignment I have that's due tomorrow on Monday. And she like logs into this web this portal that's Google Classroom, and it's like it's all of our Google stuff, but aimed for kids and mm-hmm. classes. And so I'm watching over her shoulder, and I'm slowly edging her away because I'm like, let me check this out. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I just wanted I wanted to see the product, and it was a really nice product. It like it, like there was a little there was a t- there was a card for each of her classes, and they had a little rundown of all the assignments and all this sort. Of, like it was real a really cool device, a really cool uh, platform. And I was surprised to see my old hometown school district using it. So uh, that that was nice. pretty neat. I was also I was also very happy that as opposed to going to YouTube, she wanted to go to her Google Classroom. I know, so right? Cool. Like you got your yeah, laptop. Yeah. What's the first thing you wanted? do you School have work. your own laptop yeah. i want to check in on my assignment that's yeah, a good yeah. well, student she's, right there she's a little bit on the nerd side no that's, that's okay. awesome that's, 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 that's how we were that's yeah great. so exactly that's fantastic <laughs> Yeah. Um, little bits and drabs here. Let's see here. Instant apps. I hope that we hear more about that. That seems to have been an announcement from a year ago yeah. that has really t- been slow to the taking. Um, no comment, but I know we'll see stuff about that. I've got some friends that will be demoing some instant apps. So okay, I think the instant apps thing is interesting because from from a business perspective, you you want people to use your apps, but at the same time, having an instant app kind of eliminates the ability to regain their eyeballs. They may use your app for a little bit. And then that's it. And that's on. it. And you can never get them back. If they install the app, you have a whole bunch of hooks. That you, as a developer, you can grab in and say, hey, let me re-engage that user. So Push a lot of businesses are out there saying, well, that's a cool idea, but now you've just cut off a marketing channel that I previously had. You, I mean, that's that's a fantastic point because I know I, as a user, that's exactly how I think about instant. the potential of instant apps is why am I going to install this like e-commerce site 
you know, app for this one time that I need to use it. Mm -hmm. If it gives me the instant app, I get the best of all worlds. I get the app, user, which yep. is the better experience. I do it. And then I don't have to litter, you know, my storage with, the, you know, that app stored there all the time. But that's not what a developer would want. They'd want it on there all the time. Yep. Really good point. Okay. But how do the, you convince around that? The instant app experience, I've only tried it a few times, really drives you towards installing the app. So it it's not like, um, it, I thought it's like a gateway drug. Okay. It's more like gives you a taste, but it really drives you f towards installing the app. And it's very clear that it's an instant app too. They have like a little UI ahead of it right. that tells you like, um, so, I mean, I think it, I under, I totally get that, mm -hmm. but I think it's actually the opposite. It gives you that vector t where you can like give somebody a free taste, you know, like mm -hmm. get them hooked. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I, I mean, it's it interesting. Easy. It could be, um, it could go both ways, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Good. I mean, I, I think I'm taking it from the perspective of, uh, the business owner. And the, and the marketing folks that are mm -hmm. looking at it and saying, well, I want to make sure we get those eyeballs. So, but yeah, if it's, you know, like you said, if it's a, a gateway done properly, it, it could be very useful, but it's, it's gotta be done pro properly. And I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen a big adoption for it yet. Mm -hmm. And yeah. why it's so slow rolling out. Yep. It's, yeah. Right. Yep. It's right. hard to do. And there, there's a whole thing around permissions too. Like what if it needs to look at your contacts? Well, yeah. It needs to ask you, you've probably seen those permission pop-ups before. Mm -hmm. What do you do in those situations? And there's a lot of weird edge cases that, that they have to account for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we know that we're going to hear more about Android Auto. We're already seeing deals with uh, Audi and Volvo, not just yes. uh, not just uh, hey, Android yeah. Auto, but it's like Android integrated into the the entire flipping car, you yeah. know, and, and controlling everything. That's exciting. Yes. So last year I didn't pay attention because I didn't really, and this was in the Ron Amato article. Um, I didn't pay attention, but they had a, that Maserati parked at IO that actually the whole dashboard and the whole, all the yeah, instruments were to check that out. Uh, an Android app. Really? Um, yeah. So it was more than, it wasn't just the entertainment unit. It was actual, Everything. Uh, like car instruments were all Android auto. I didn't really realize it until actually I read this article that that's what mm -hmm. we were looking at last mm -hmm. year, but that's really interesting. That's a whole different product. And now you've got uh, Audi and Volvo uh, hopping on that train. Makes um, so much sense for those manufacturers because they're not software developers. Right. They have no, their uh, product cycles are so short. I mean, so many different factors that it just makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to like take yep. that away from them. Yep. Uh, and then think we're going to hear any sort of anything about Fuchsia. We talked about that last week on this show, which is, yeah. I don't think oh, so. I no. think it's just another 20% another product thing that that's just happening behind the scenes. Very hard to <laughs> disengage the huge de Android developer community. I mean, mm -hmm. it's probably the biggest developer community in the world. At least Java is. Um, right. It's, it's really hard to upset that Apple cart. Yeah, right. Uh, it's still very intriguing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sad that uh, ATAP doesn't appear to be a big thing anything <laughs> yeah but are, but are you so but are you surprised i'm not surprised I'm, at all i I'm feel like atap is like go away it's in the back room yeah i mean yeah. i'm 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 not surprised but i'm disappointed because for the last three years definitely atap has been one of the events that is like you do what you can to make sure that you're there for it because it's always very it's just it's exciting it's an exciting um kind of you know opening up of the curtain to show what's possible and mm -hmm. they're all they're always working on something very interesting um i saw an article on business insider today about atap and kind of checking in on it and from the inside you know people who are still working there they say morale is still high but the whole idea of pirates doing epic shit which is what you know they yeah. kind of said that first time um that is kind of gone away they've really toned it down to just kind of like creating hopefully working on creating products that are marketable and not being as much of an experimental arm, which is kind of disappointing because it was exciting. It yeah. seems like the moonshot organization, I, I don't mean the specific moonshot organization, but that concept in Google is being ramped down a little yeah, bit. It does like seem like it really does. Mm -hmm. The crazy stuff that Google used to do isn't quite as crazy anymore. Yeah. Um, then, any final thoughts? I mean, Android Pay hands-free, we might hear something about that. We talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, something else called Android Extensions, which I, I only kind of understand. Ron Amadio tried to, to pick it apart. Yeah. It's basically similar to how Play Services is updated. Um, and, and so that kind of freed everyone at least a little bit from 
uh, major OS, you know, or APIs uh, being tied to the OS. It could be updated through the Play Store. This would be for AOSP stuff, kind yeah. of in a similar fashion. Yeah. So th this is interesting. I actually wrote an article about this, about how the Android ecosystem is very fragmented, uh -huh. and this is another one of those attempts to help solve that. Oh. And so the the goal here is to allow device manufacturers to update the OS with regular Android operating system updates. Yeah. I mean, everybody's bought those devices you get and then all of a sudden your friend who has the pixel or the nexus gets the update and you never get it yeah and one of those reasons is because when they have to update the operating system on that phone they have to also update the new firmware or anything else they've built around it and it's a very slow and expensive process and these extensions are hopefully going to be enable this process to be a lot easier and a lot smoother mm, okay that could be that could be kind of a big deal yeah so you make you could get your updates a little bit faster which would be nice yeah and uh, it reminds me about something that we'll talk about here in a few minutes uh, <laughs> after we move on from IO and thank sponsor. But before before we move on, uh, any final thoughts, IO? You guys excited? Or are you kind of like, eh? Uh, excited always. Excited. Uh, always. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, what about you, Ron? I'm, I'm super excited and I'm excited for the thing that we don't even know to predict or yeah. has been leaked yet. Like last year, we didn't see Homecoming. We didn't see, you know, like there were there was stuff we were still surprised about. I know, knowing Google, there will be surprises. So I'm excited for that. Mm -hmm. There always seem to be. And I'm very yeah. excited for that as well. Uh, all right. We've got lots of other things to talk about. We spend a little bit longer on IO than I thought we were going to. But really, in reality, I knew we were going to spend a lot of time talking about it because it's exciting stuff. Before we get to the rest of the week's news, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode. That's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, which is perfect for all of you listening and watching because you probably live your lives in the digital world. You live your lives on the internet. So you're used to doing all of these important things online. And then you go to get a mortgage for a home that you want to buy and you have to meet with someone in person. You have to pull the information you know, from your filing cabinet and do all this sort of manual in real IRL stuff. Uh, in this case, Rocket Mortgage makes it easy for you to live your digital life and do this all uh, the way you're used to doing things. And not only that, they're trustworthy. They have your best interest in mind and they'll help you along the way. With Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process, gives you the confidence to make an informed decision throughout. So you won't waste that time searching through stacks of paperwork. Uh, you'll get a secure, uh, just a secure process where you can share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage and get a, a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and the length of your loan. You can play with the numbers, uh, do that in real time, kind of shift it around, make sure that you get the mortgage solution that's just right for you. Whether you're looking to buy a home or even refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. And it makes it just a whole lot easier for you too. So skip the bank, skip the waiting, go completely online at quickenloans.com slash Android. That's quickenloans.com slash Android. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Without further ado, it's time for some hardware. <laughs> Ooh, Ron, you got the good one. Ooh, the big news. Big news before Google I.O. I saw this come out last week, and I was like, oh, they're getting things ready for I.O. They're, yeah. they're setting the stage for these discussions. Uh, Google announced Project Treble last week, which is going to fix one of the biggest complaints we have about the Android ecosystem. Uh, so Project Treble is basically a new framework, a new way to separate vendor modifications of Android from Google's own parts of Android. All right, so what this means is that it allows Google to make changes to the operating system that don't interfere with the vendor modifications. So basically this means that Google could update Android devices without interference from the, ma the manufacturers or even the carriers if it goes that far. Um, and this, the one thing though is that it does require the vendors to play ball on how they create their devices. So a Samsung would need to adjust to adhere to the standards to make Project Treble work. Uh, but, you know, ostensibly this could be, you know, pr stage fright happens again and there's a big, you know, big security issue. Google could roll out an update that can go directly to devices, devices bypassing the manufacturers. This is huge. Um, of course, they say more info is coming from I.O., but there was a whole website uh, that they that they uh, rolled out 
that kind of addressed this and kind of gave some more documentation to it. Big news last week. It doesn't fix the problem 100%, but it definitely is making steps towards giving Google a little more control on how the uh, updates get out to devices. Uh, Mike, what did, Mike, Don, what did you guys make of this uh, kind of announcement? Is this kind of as a developer side of things, like a huge sigh of relief? For me, it's uh, it's a huge glimmer of hope, as I like to put <laughs> glimmer it. Glimmer of hope. <laughs> um, we've heard some of these things that happened before. We had a lot of the, the, the CCD documents, which is what the hardware manufacturers are supposed to adhere to over the years to make sure that they're compatible. But again, these, these modifications to the system would happen. And then, you know, for some reason, they couldn't update the, the device because of whatever software integrations were set up before, which I kind of spoke about just recently. Yeah. So I think this is a move in the right direction. Is Samsung or the other manufacturers going to adhere to this? I don't know. There's a lot of, mon you know, I've worked with Android for many years now. They make a lot of modifications. They like to do a lot of crazy things. Mike can attest to this. As developers, the biggest pain point we deal with is Samsung. Uh, so we're going to see how things go. My, I'm hoping for the best, though. As developer, okay, explain that. The, the biggest pain point that you have to deal with is Samsung. Why is that? Because they just have so many devices in the marketplace and they go their own way so many times? They go their own way so many times. Yes. Like okay. you said, uh, so many cases of this is broken on a Samsung device on yes. the texting. Dang, okay. Uh, so For sure, what John just said, Samsung is, the, also they have so many devices, There's obviously, so like the fact that they're the number one device that we're probably targeting in every market pretty much means that those nuances are super important and we have to right. deal with them. Like if, you know, as some other manufacturer that doesn't have a huge impact on our user base, we probably would say, oh, well, it's broken there. Those guys will have to deal with it. But when it's broken on the Samsung S6, you have to put in hard work to make it, it, it and work. And There's fix a it around users, Samsung's yeah. problem. Yeah. There's a million users using the S5 or whatever, and for some reason it's crashing on this particular screen on an S5 because of a particular th thing that Samsung did with uh, that particular device release. And then, of course, keep in fun. mind, to circle back to what we were talking about originally, well, Samsung doesn't update their OS very frequently, or so it's not like you can count on then on you know updating or fixing the problem. Oh, yeah. You have to work around it, and you know that you have to work around it for basically forever because they're not going to patch it. Yeah. So. Interesting. All right. So I'm going to jump ahead, actually, and read the email from today because it totally ties into what we're talking about here. Albert Rubio in Barcelona, who has a OnePlus 3, he wants us to know that, uh, brought up seamless updates. This is something that uh, was a big announcement for Nougat last year, I think, at Google I.O. This is one of the things that they touted. Maybe it wasn't at Google I.O. I know at some point, but it was definitely a feature at Nougat. And he says, it's one of my favorite features of Nougat, uh, but nobody talks about it except the Pixel owners. Do you know if Samsung, LG, HTC, or any other OEM is using this feature on the new flagships, or are we still on the traditional method? I know changing the partition table on old phones is difficult and potentially dangerous for non-tech people, but there are no excuses on new launches. This is kind of the same problem, yep. right? So, so yep. basically, um, seamless updates allowed, it's a new way of partitioning the device so that when there is a major system update happening, it would download and prep the install in real time while you're using the device so that when you go to restart after mm -hmm. the update has been downloaded, the the boot up then, the update process is really fast. It's already been done in the background instead of what most people experience, which is you download the update, you power down, you boot up, you wait, it does all this extra stuff. It's like this long drawn out process that happens after the power up. Mm -hmm. In this case, because of the different system architecture, it's done before you ever power up your or power off your device. But that requires manufacturers to kind of do things a little bit different. It does, yeah. Yes, it's a feature of Nougat, but it requires manufacturers to kind of tailor their device to that new feature, and no one seems to be doing that. Could we end up in the same situation with Treble, do you think? It's very Is possible. Treble Treble? <laughs> it's very possible we could end up in the same in the in the same boat, but I think yeah. what's happening is, is Google is kind of narrowing this gap of of the things that can possibly go wrong, and they're trying to right. tighten that the the handle on the Android operating system. They want more control there, and overall, I think that's that's a good thing, and yeah. we're moving in the right direction. For sure. When is it going to happen? I don't know. The sooner, the better, though. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What What are your thoughts, Ron? Are you, Are you feeling uh, optimistic, or how do you feel on this? Yeah. I think yeah, I think it's any any step forward is a good step. I think that this is you know it's it's it, they're gonna they're not gonna be able to tackle this with sweeping change. It's gonna have to happen with baby steps and with the uh, with the partnership and commitment of the manufacturers. So this is the I think this is a good step in that right direction. And then the question is, we'll see how how well the manufacturers play with it, and that will dictate the next step. Yeah, yeah. So. 
Uh, but I, I completely agree. Like th this is not to say Google should never try and, yeah. and push out, you know, updates that that promise big ideas like this because this is what Google needs to do. Arguably, this may have been what Google needed to do a long time yes. ago, and maybe we'd be at a different point now. But at least they're doing it now, and, and let's just hope that the manufacturers yeah. actually play ball because these are really important things. It's they important are people. Uh, there was an, uh, pro a product announcement from HTC last night late. Like I was up late and I was checking uh, Twitter and I was like, wait a minute, there's an event going on right now. And I think it was like midnight my time. HTC unveiled its latest flagship. It uh, has some, a couple of very unique options. It's the HTC U11. This is definitely their next flagship. Definitely many would consider this the successor to last year's HTC 10. Uh, even though it, in design, it looks a lot different and functionality is very different. But before kind of the unique aspects, the basic specs, 5.5 inch, uh, 2560 by 1440 LCD display, 2.45 gigahertz, eight core Snapdragon 835. So it's using the most recent, the, the, the most up-to-date Snapdragon processor, four gigs RAM, 64 gig storage, micro SD card slot, uh, 16 megapixel and 12 megapixel cameras, 3000 milliamp hour battery and IP67. So it's water and dust resistant. Does not have a headphone jack, <clears throat> requires a dongle. But they include a dongle, so you get the dongle. So there's at least that, I suppose. The, uh, the, the, ongo the ongoing legacy of the HTC dongles. <laughs> of the headphone dongle, which you, you seem to be okay with, Ron. I still have a hard time giving up my headphone jack. But I understand. I understand where where you side on it. Okay. Well, I just, I just, I'm just more for the 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 progress of moving Future. forward. But I still, you know, I still, I'm using wired headphones all the time. So yeah. whatever. I'm not, I'm not walking the walk. Right. <laughs> um, one of these days, we'll probably be forced to walk the walk. We'll just have yep, to face up sure. to that. Uh, okay. So two very unique features. One, it has dual wake words. So it has, uh, it has okay access assistant running underneath sorry i just dang it <laughs> sorry i i tried to filter myself but i didn't do it uh <laughs> it also has amazon's wake word there i filtered mm. that one uh so that's running underneath as well so you've got both of the voice assistants amazon's and google's running underneath at the same time for Is my the amazon assistant on any other phones that was something i was thinking about when we were talking about assistant before mm. not sure mm. Because they're really, you know, yeah. the Amazon Assistant is pretty um, capable and it's it's being pushed hard. Mm -hmm. Man, I wonder. I feel like maybe, maybe chat I room? have heard of it. Yeah, chat room. Work on that like one. On fire devices and, or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely working on. Ah, there we go. Huawei Mate 9 had a. Oh, dang it. I said it out loud. <laughs> supposed to not say these words. It's really hard to not say them. Uh, thank you, Wade County. Huawei Mate 9 had it. So I guess our, that could be assumed that it had both um, as well. So anyways, so that's one key feature here. Second key feature is probably what it's known for <laughs> is that it has a squeezable frame on the lower half. So if you're holding, so like if, you, if this is how you hold your phone, you can go eh, on the frame. And if you do a short squeeze, that's going to fire off an action that you determine. Yep. If you do a long squeeze, that fires off a different action that you mm. determine. So you've got two different action points by squeezing the frame. Is this progress? What do you think? <laughs> I don't even know what to think about. <laughs> I could see that as kind of being useful. It's actually yeah. very natural. That's how you're I know, holding right? your phone. Like, yeah. Totally. I'm um, going to have a lot of pictures in my pocket. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I like, worry I'm about it being... A lot of pocket pictures. Po po pocket pictures on the squeezing aspect of like when you s sit down or whatever. Yeah. And like, what do you think, Ron? I would like to see some sort of kids app that is associated with it. So when you squeeze it, it goes, I love you. Or like, it's like a huggable phone, you know, like that wow. sort of thing. Or it's like a whoopee so. cushion. Yeah, or yeah, a whoopee cushion. No, I, <laughs> I, but I think that's, I think that's, I think it's neat. I think it's an interaction that we haven't, really thought about and i think that the way we you know use these we we complain about all the and htc is one of the worst uh, offenders but you know i know i complain about the lack of innovation in hardware and that you know so many phones are anonymous china phone and htc kind of led that kind of uh march with their you know with the m series even though i do like the m series a lot but it got copied by a lot of other uh a, 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 a lot of other companies but i like that they're looking for different ways for us to interact with these devices and have different touch points um i think squeezing is a little kind of wacky but i 
I like wacky, so I, I'm cool with it. A thumbs yeah. up it. It's wacky, yeah. but I mean, it's it's yeah. like having another button on your device. You know what yeah. I mean? It's really just the same thing. It's just instead of hitting a button, you're squeezing the device. Uh, Sean in chat says that there is a pocket mode, so the squeeze would not be triggered in the oh, pocket. Okay. So your, right, well, your, your wishes have been answered. <laughs> awesome. Okay, good. So you can get this phone. Good. You're going right, to get good, it, right? No, that's it. I'm lining up. No. Putting in the order. All right. Well, you only have to pay six hundred forty nine dollars, which is not oh, a bad all. price. Not a bad price. Yeah. Uh, for their, you know, they 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 could have gone the other direction. Some of these flagships come out, and it's like, man, you'd had something if it was priced two hundred dollars lower. So. <laughs> right. Uh, pre order now. Not a bad looking phone. Hopefully, we'll get that here in studio and play around with that. Give it a little squeeze. And <laughs> make squeeze. Make it our main I squeeze. I think they missed the boat of calling it the U11 and not calling it the HTC Squeeze. You like, certainly why would, would know what yeah. you're getting if it was called the HTC Squeeze. Just lean into it. Lean into it. I'm for it. <laughs> you might as well own it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good job, HTC. Uh, and we'll check back in on that. All right. It's time for the other kind of hardware. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when we can get Brian. You got him. He was playing. He was playing with his Nintendo Switch. I bet. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we talked about earlier Google I/O. There will be an Android Wear session, uh, but there, who knows what they're going to talk about? For one thing, they probably won't talk about the fact that Asus is ending its line of Zen watches. <gasps> um, so a report from Digit Digitimes. Uh, reports that Asus has sold about five to six thousand per month. Very low sales. Um, you might remember that Motorola has already pulled out of Android Wear devices. Samsung is more devoted to ties in with their Samsung Gear devices than as opposed to Android Wear. And we've seen fashion brands releasing watches. Um, you know, Fossil and things like that. You know, we've seen you know watch brands selling uh, you know smart watches. And maybe that's kind of where Android Wear belongs. Not so much with the folks making phones and tablets, but with the folks making watches. Um, you know, who knows? But if anything, it's not turning phone makers into watchmakers. Uh, and then also the LG Watch Sport was canceled at Verizon. So that's one less uh, Android Wear uh, device available for Verizon customers. Um, so what do we guys, what do we think? Are we surprised by this, that, that Asus is, is uh, backing away from the Android Wear spec? Are, are we only going to be able to get smartwatches from actual watch manufacturers? Like, um, uh, what's the what's the name of that company? Like, Tag Heuer, that's who it is. Tag Heuer uh, and Tag Michael Heuer. Kors. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine they sold many of those Tag Heuer uh, Android Wear watches. They're, I mean, they're very expensive. Fifteen hundred dollars, and yeah. I mean, so now it's already out of date. It's Android Wear two point oh. They, like, they, they built in though, to their credit, they built in some nice future proofing aspects to they, that deal. They basically said if you buy this after a couple of years, like the, I think they made it modular, so you could actually swap out the smartwatch aspect of I it see. with oh, an analog that's version. Smart. Um, on the previous oh, they one, did. You're right, they, give you, they gave you the ability after two years to swap it for a, like a, an actual analog watch or whatever. I don't know what that says about smartwatches when yeah. they're giving you all of these ways out of it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but, but they were but at least future proofing it a little bit. But here's the thing about watch people is that not necessarily, you know, early adopters on the tech side like we are, but people who are into watches are into watches. And dropping a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars on a watch is not an uncommon thing. Like there are some real right. piece of art watches that are out there, and I th I really think that Android Wear is better suited with people who are watchmakers than with people who are technology makers. You know that there's a way to bridge the gap between the two. Um, you know you, who knows if Tag Heuer sold five to six thousand like Asus did, but th their sales expectations are probably lower, and and they yeah. probably meet them because they know the audience a lot better. Right. Uh, and do you trust? And and do you trust like a watchmaker like Tag oh. Heuer? to design a user interface for a smartwatch, you know, and an operating right. system for a smartwatch, or do you trust like a company like Google to create a smartwatch OS that, yeah, yeah, it's interesting how- So I probably trust Tag Heuer to create a watch that I'd actually want to wear. Right. And yeah. I think that's the big difference, right? And that's maybe to Ron's point. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Right, because I mean, the, the watches that have come from the tech makers I mean, there have been some okay, but you're usually going like, oh, yeah, that's pretty nice. It's okay. I mean, it's that's cool. Nice. I'll wear it. It's not the ugliest thing. That looks thing. really good compared to the other ones. Right. You know, dot, yeah. dot, dot compared to the others. Yep. Um, so maybe this is maybe this is where Android Wear really, uh, you know, finds its finds its place is that these major watch manufacturers want to have skin in the game in the technology world. And they trust Google to create the, uh, the interface for that, the interface for that.
Um, all right. Uh, let's. Well, Ron, you got this. <laughs> Yeah, let's 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 thank our next sponsor, uh, and we want to thank Tracker for sponsoring this episode of All About Android. Uh, and Tracker, I cannot live with my out my Tracker device. Uh, life is supposed to be a journey of discovery, but how much of it do you waste trying to discover where you left your keys? I have this problem all the time. Not my you'll kind never of discovery. Yeah, you'll never worry about losing your things again thanks to Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone. Simply place a tracker device on whatever you tend to lose, keys, wallets, bags, pets, anything that you need to keep track of. Use the tracker app to find it in just seconds. You can tra track up to 10 devices at once on your phone. You can even track and ring the same device from multiple phones and tracker accounts. And you can customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind. And let me tell you, that is amazing. Like it's the kind of thing where if you leave your keys in the house and you walk out the door, your phone will beep and say, hey, you're separated from your stuff. You need it. Uh, so what if you lose your phone? Just press the button on your tracker device or ask your Amazon Echo and your phone will ring even if it's on silent. If you need more help, the new tracker Pixel comes with powerful LED lights so you can find your items in a flash. It's available in fun seasonal colors, and with over 4.5 million devices shipped, Tracker has the largest crowd locate network in the world, so you can find your item even if it's miles away. So try Tracker today with their 30-day money-back guarantee. You can find what you've been missing. Go to thetracker.com, that's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, and enter promo code AAA, and you'll get a free Tracker Bravo with any order. That's the tracker.com, T H E T R A C K R.com, promo code AA for your free tracker Bravo with any order and stop losing your things. It's amazing. Changed my life. Thank you, tracker. Stop it. Stop losing your stop things. It. Set that down <laughs> and then remember where it is because you've got tracker attached to it. Okay. All right. Uh, without, without further ado, let's go into apps now. Apparently today I say without further ado a lot. <laughs> Without further ado, another time of me saying without further ado. Uh, Netflix is using Google's Wide Vine, apparently, DRM system, to target root and unlocked Android devices. So if you're a root user, uh, listen up, if you haven't already realized it anyways, uh, in an effort to block them from using the app. It seems like short term what this is really doing for people who have rooted devices or unlocked devices is that it's making it so that if they don't already have it installed and they search for Netflix in the Play Store, it doesn't surface. It's like it, it triggers the, the warning to the Play Store that you are on a rooted device and as such do not show Netflix because Netflix does not allow for that. Uh, event, but, but some people have noticed that they, if they have the app installed, they can still run it even though they're on a rooted device. Uh, Netflix seems to say that this will not be the case though. At some point, uh, Netflix app will just not run unrooted or unlocked devices. Um, I haven't rooted or unlocked. Well, I unlock my device sometimes, but I haven't rooted my device in a really long time. Uh, do either of you guys? I do don't uh, I don't root or, or unlock usually at all because I want my device to be very close to how my users have it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. I'm sure the same for you. Mike. Same for me. I don't want to root my device because I want my device to be stable and working. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's not really anything that you, well, that I, I should say there's nothing I need to root my device for. Yeah. At yeah. this point, so it's a very personal like decision. You know <laughs> what I mean? People hold it very close to their heart. If they if they root uh, their device, they're probably doing it for a very specific reason, or they like the advanced kind of customization that you can do around that. Yeah, the um, do you think there's a lot of people? I mean, is there still a, a large community of people that are rooting specifically to get around things like DRM and? And to you know, hack so apps and steal I, video content. I bet you that. Uh, well, I, I hate to make generalizations, but I would think that probably a lot of the rooters that is, you know, kind of the type of people they are. Not, uh, I'm saying that in a bad way. I don't mean it that way. But I think yes. I think you a think lot of people people are rooting are rooting for nefarious purposes. You know, to get around DRM or to do things that maybe they're not supposed to do. I mean, I feel like some people. Some, some people, people. I know. I, I said that wrong. I don't mean to like. Disparage all rooters, right? Um, like there, there, there is definitely a, there is definitely a segment of the root community that that does that. I'm sure. Um, there are also a lot of people that just root because like they get to you know skin their phone yep. the way they absolutely yep. want it, or they get deeper level you know file access for whatever reason they need that. There's a huge community for that for sure. Yeah, X XDA has a ton of them. You know. So oh, absolutely. Very busy community. And the uh, chat room brings up a good point, and that's developing nations where you know maybe. Our needs are different than that's a good uh, point. 
some people that are in different countries that maybe have other restrictions, you know. Yeah. Full full device backups. Great, great uh, case right there. Um, ad blocking. Some people do it uh, because counting. they get a, a deeper ad blocking. Which kind of brings up a good one. You can bring back some of those old devices. Uh -huh. if you get a, you know, a, a very light ROM on it. It doesn't have a bunch of bloat on it. Yep. You can actually mm -hmm. bring those, you know, you can actually bring that Nexus 9 back to life there, Ron. Well, it's still working, but yeah, it's a good point. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and and, the, and the, th the thing is, I feel like rooting, whereas uh, years ago, rooting was something that you had to do in order to unlock a whole bunch of cool stuff. Now it's way more on the really, you know, deep in the weeds, you know, kind of tech hobbyist, you know, who, you know, the, and the average user isn't using titanium backup or going to root level ad blocking, you know, like the average, like the, the needs to root or, I mean, Jason, you used to root on a daily basis. You, I, I did you, used you to root on a daily like, basis. You, you, were, you were like, you, you had root access and you installed the ROMs literally every day. Yeah. And at, and at some point you stopped because Android solved the problems that rooting were, was needed to solve. So, uh, you know, I think it's more just of a hobbyist thing now. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure some people still totally find the ways that Android is lacking and why root needs to happen. I mean, you know, full backup is actually a really great reason why people root because some yeah. people and, and I know that in the in the app development world that is frowned upon that can be frowned upon because that can take an app, you know, do a full backup of it. And, you know, if it was, say, a paid app and not cleared for one device, you could still restore that backup and potentially have access to that app, even though it was a paid app and you didn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that there is that kind of pushback, but you know, some people really just want like a full system image. I know when I was rooting, I did that all the time. I had so many like full, because I was rooting yep. and because I could mess something up on my phone in the process, I had a lot of just like image free, frozen images of my phone at that point in time. And if something went wrong, it was easy for me to reflash it and get my device back back to where it was as if nothing had happened. Yep, you can't easy. really do that easily without root. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, you can do elements of it, but you can't do the full kit and caboodle. So, um, so I, yeah, and I don't know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this is a, the result of a deal that net, you know, that, that deals with the, the content providers. It, there's, there's Netflix. also some, some development tools that, uh, Google's now providing you like, device attestation. I probably completely butchered the how you say <laughs> that. But they provide a service now where you can actually send out data about the device and they'll let you know, hey, is this device rooted? So Google's actually providing developers and companies with these tools to let you know, hey, is this, this device is in this particular state. It's up to you as an app to Developer. let them know, hey, do you want to move forward or not? Yeah, do you want to support it? Interesting that you bring that up because I had not heard of this. It's called Magisk. Or ma I'm assuming it's Magisk, but it's essentially it's something that you can use. I'm just throwing this out there because it's basic information here. Uh, <laughs> something that you can use if you are rooted to essentially, from what I understand, kind of uh, represent your device in a different way than it actually is. In other words, it could be used to spoof Netflix into thinking that you are not in fact rooted or spoof Pokemon Go, which Pokemon Go also has a restriction on rooted devices mm. because people were spoofing their location. Right. And Makes being sense. able to just jump over there and get, you know, grab up all the Pokemon Go characters they want. So uh, Android Pay is another one that that, that uh, has right. has limitations. So apparently Magisk is one way to get around it if you so choose. If you're rooted, there's <laughs> absolutely no way for the developer to know that you're uh, there. There are, if you're rooted, you can block it. You can make it look like you're not rooted. So okay. like, uh, I've worked on a few security apps. Mm -hmm. The there's always the top bullet is if the phone is rooted, all security is out the door basically, and there's nothing we can do about that. There's no way. I mean, obviously Google's pretty smart. They probably have some secret, you know, deeper ways. But if right. a phone is rooted, it's pretty much nothing the developer can do about mm -hmm. controlling and, it or. And it's I mean, in my opinion, it's such a small market <laughs> right. compared That's to the entire market of that, size yeah. of Android. Mm -hmm. it's just, I, don't know, I find it interesting that, that Netflix is going this route. I wonder why they're doing it. I'm, I'm not surprised at all. I'm, with, with knowing, with the experience that I have with content companies and media companies mm -hmm. and piracy and all things like that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some partner out there who has brought this up to Netflix and they're doing this as a concession in order to make a deal. 
you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. and who knows? And this is tons of speculation, but Disney has been circling the waters around Netflix. There have been a lot of rumors between Disney and Netflix, um, you know, rumors that Disney uh, is looking at you know, potentially purchasing Netflix um, in order to solve their distribution problem as well as their senior leadership problem because they need a replacement uh, for Bob Iger because he wants to retire desperately. Um, and not saying that Disney is what's causing this, but – they're in bed with, you know, Disney is moving to releasing all their stuff exclusively on Netflix. I would not be surprised if they're like, well, if some suit read an article about rooted devices and goes, well, we should be blocking these. And then that went down the chain and right. this is where we end up. Yeah, you know, it's, it's sounds a lot like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would agree. All right. You got the next one, Ron. All right. So uh, we were talking earlier about Allo and why it really hasn't taken off with users. And Google might have figured it out now with this new feature that's rolling out. Uh, the Allo is rolling out a brand new amazing feature that's going to allow you to take a selfie and then it will analyze it and create a custom sticker based on your features. I got the update. I, I checked it yesterday and I didn't have it, but I have it here. So oh. you so, talk about it and I'll see if I can get it to do it. So, so what's going to happen is that they've got image recognition that will analyze your face, map the features, and then AI will create 22, 22 custom stickers for oh, you. And Google says that there are 563 quadrillion faces the tool is able to create. And uh, okay. this is <laughs> so <it's laughs> thanks downloading to the my giant. stickers. Yep. Oh, here it is. There's Jason and Allo. All right. So this is me, huh? <laughs> this is me that, on fire. Okay. So that looks save. just like you. Hey, I got to tell you, the one of you in the garbage can, that is actually oddly accurate. Let's see here. <laughs> ah, don't look at that. Okay. We'll have to blur Well, that. you can just see my name. Let's uh, see. You can, yeah. Uh, does it allow me to do, how do I, no. Okay. Hold on. Go away for a second. Sorry. I have to figure out what I can actually show here. <laughs> this is the problem with Allo. I don't know what I can show. I don't think it shows the phone number, does so it? So can I take those emoticons out of Allo? Okay, okay. So so let's see here. So this is just random random chit-chat. So where do I find what I just made? So sticker? Add, add sticker. Oh, there it yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, okay. There I am sipping coffee. There I am as a zombie. Oh, nice. Uh, there I am looking... The greatest thing about right. this is that, uh, is that is that you're sending it to our group text of Flo, and she's at her dinner right now, and her phone just blew up with all these stickers, and she has no idea why. That's fantastic. Here I am, just a little discombobulated. Uh, neat. So, yeah, and I think what I find interesting about this is, so it's AI doing all the work here. 563 quadrillion faces, like you said, based on all of the like combinations, the analysis of the features of your face, and then combining that with what it recognizes and matches it against <clears throat> with all of these different elements to create basically a more or less a customized image that no one else probably is going to have. Yeah. Uh, all this kind of looks somewhat generic to me, but Still very it looks cool. like, no. It, lo it looks like a cartoony version of your face. If I if we like had an illustrator draw your face and they came up with that, I would believe it. Not understanding yeah, why I have gray hair, but anyways, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're all getting old, Jason. Sorry. <laughs> no, I refuse to. It's true. I refuse it's true. to admit it. But I gotta say, if anything's gonna make Allo get market share over WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, it's gonna be this. I'm so glad they're focused on the important features. I'm being sarcastic. Bleak doesn't think it looks anything like me, in all caps. Of course you're critical, Bleak. We pay you to be critical. Um, I don't know, kind, kind of cool. I mean, it's not going to solve Allo's yeah, problem. it's pretty cool. I mean, but, I like uh, the, the AI integration of yeah. Allo using it. I mean, it's Probably actually going to hear a little bit more about that yeah. tomorrow because yeah. if they, you know, if it's all about <laughs> AI and how mm -hmm. you as a developer can work AI in, into your apps effectively and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. This is kind of an, a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. so. All right, before we get into the arena, let's thank the sponsor of today's episode. That is Hover. I have a number of Hover URLs. I love Hover. Uh, when you happen to have a great idea for a blog or or your startup or whatever it happens to be, you need to give it a great domain name. You know this, it's not always the easiest thing in the world to find a great domain name, but with Hover, it's easy to set up your domain name uh, with the most popular website builders. Hover has over 400 domain extensions. All the classics, of course. You can celebrate the classics entire catalog, .com, .net, for example. Uh, niche extensions like .design and .tech. Quirky ones like .pizza. Who doesn't want .pizza? Uh, .ninja.horse. <laughs> Once you find your domain... 
uh, use Hover Connect to set up your domain automatically with your website in just a few clicks. You can also use it to get a more on-brand or professional email address. Your domain works with whatever email programs you're already using, thankfully. When all you want to do is buy a domain name or an email address, you shouldn't have to opt out of page after page of add-ons uh, that you don't actually want or don't need. I've experienced that many times with other ones. Uh, that's why Hover only offers domains and email. So you can focus on finding a great domain name and get back to working on your great idea. Unlike most other domain providers, Hover includes free Whois privacy with all supported domains to keep your information confidential. And if you already have multiple domains scattered across other domain providers, you can save money by just bringing them all over to Hover. Eligible domains will include Whois privacy. They include it. With volume discounts, the more domains you have in your account, the more of a discount Hover will automatically apply to your account. With Hover, there's no more digging through help articles to figure out how to get your domain working. If you need a hand, you just give them a call and Hover's awesome support team is there to help you. No annoying phone trees or you know being transferred to another department to find the answer that you need. First, uh, first thing to do right now is just to find a domain name for your idea. Go to hover.com slash AAA. You're gonna get 10% off your first purchase. That's hover.com slash AAA. Hover, domain names for your ideas, for your best ideas. That's hover.com slash AAA. And we thank them for their support. All right, without, oh, I already said it, so I'll say it again. Without further ado, man, I need to wipe that from my vocabulary, apparently. It's time for the arena. So Jeez. many enter, <laughs> but only one lives. Android. Arena. It's one of those things that once you once you figure it out and you call it out, it's, then you keep hearing it. Then you keep hearing mm -hmm. it and saying it, and it never goes away. I just put a note in the doc. It says, "Don't say without further ado." Call me out on it, will you, folks? All right. So we're going to dive into last week's poll first and foremost. If you go there now, you're going to see a little something strange. Is because I accidentally put in this week's information on top of last week's information, but that's okay because last week's information. Is still there. So we can see who won. If we take a look at the confusing pie chart, uh, we will see. Brian, do you happen to have that? I'm logging into it right now. It looks as if TripAdvisor is first place with 55.5% of the votes. Second place is AMOLED minimal, minimal wallpaper at 27.3%. That was mine. Flow had TripAdvisor, so Flow wins. Dang, with authority. Uh, minimal wallpaper is second, 27.3%. And then third place is Wallaby at 15.3%. So with those, with those results, that means the updated standings, thanks to Wade County in the chat room, through 19 weeks, I take a hit because I missed last week. I wasn't on. So, Jason, you have moved into first place with 54 points. Um, I'm in second with 53. Flo is catching up with 48 points, and our guests are in last with 46 points. <gasps> you guys um, have. Going to bring it. Going to change that today. Gonna, I feel pretty good. It. Well, yeah, two get two guests now in the house, so there's there's two even two better chances to do, to. Uh, That's true. To, yeah. Yeah. So. That's a game. And no flow, which means flow yep. that that puts her yep. even at more of a disadvantage. It really, it really behooves you to not miss the show. It and does. so that's yeah. So that's what it is. Um, so I guess since I wasn't here last week, I go first. But Jason, I'm wondering if you already installed my app on another phone. Can you uninstall it? Because I really would like to see the onboarding. Because I feel like that explains it very well. Is that oh, too annoying? Okay. Um, let me let me see here. You want someone else to go first? Well, no, no, I can explain it while he does that, but let's just make sure he can do it. Can you uninstall it and then I can, reinstall yeah, it? Yeah, I'll, I'll uninstall okay. it and reinstall it. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll vamp for a little bit. Um, so a couple of people tweeted this at me, and I kind of – usually when people like – you know, I really appreciate everyone who tweets at me and says, hey, this would be good for the arena. Um, and I always try to check it out. And a lot of times um, – sometimes they're good suggestions, sometimes they're not. But given my – uh, my enjoyment of ridiculous uh, interfaces for Android phones. Uh, when the app Linux CLI launcher was recommended to me and I checked it out, I laughed heartily and uh, said, oh yes, this will be the one I'm taking to the arena. And what this basically is, is a launcher that changes your entire home screen and your entire interface to your phone to the Linux command line. Okay, and it's not so exactly I'm all good. 
by the way. Yeah, it's not exactly the Linux command line, but it is a uh, very similar command line that you would recognize if you're a Linux user. So as you open up the app for the first time, it kind of walks you through how to use it, and it explains that you know you're going to get a bash command prompt, you know the dollar sign, and you can hit help, and that will give you all the information. It's called TUI, is kind of the is the name of the app, even though in the app store it's Linux CLI launcher. Um, so if you if you hit the right arrow button at the bottom, so you can do help. How to um, use your apps? Yeah, basically to launch an app, you just type the name of the app. Um, and if for some reason there's something that you want to do with apps, you can get a little help and just say help apps. And it tells you all the different things. And you can look at hidden files. You can look at the <laughs> Google Play Store page. There's all this really interesting coding that goes in on the command li command li uh, level, uh, command line uh, interface. Um, and then from here, you could also use commands to use your phone. So if you wanted to call someone, all you got to do is type call and the contact name and it launches the phone and does that. If you want to uninstall an app, you just type uninstall and the app name. Uh, you can quickly use a calculator. Just use calc and then do the calculation and it does it. Um, and of course, you can also use all your favorite Linux command line com um, file commands like RM, CP, and MV for file management. And um, if you want to you know, view the files that are saved on your phone, you just do open and then the path and you can go see them. Um, so, <laughs> and then of course you can use, there's various controls of your device. If you want to turn Wi-Fi on and off, you just hit Wi-Fi. Um, if you want to use the flashlight, you just type flash. And then there's other commands like airplane and Bluetooth and data, true or data false to turn off data. Um, but so let's get through the, through the rest of this. Of course, there's also a text editor, which is really cool. Um, it's its own text editor. Uh, but when it loads, uh, when the when the uh, when it actually loads up, what you get in the upper left hand corner is it shows you, um, you know, the the how much RAM is currently free. And then if you let's say type help, uh, there you go. You can go to the, the help. actually get rid of the dot. You got a dot in there. Help. Yep. And so now you see it's it's also doing auto suggestion, which is actually really really cool. So and if you hit enter or the 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 there you go, it gives you all the help commands that you can do in there. Um, you could type type flash and it'll turn on the flashlight. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I love it. It's just like uh, oh. why? Who would do this? Did it turn the flashlight on? Yes, it did. Look it at did. that. <laughs> do I just do flash again yep. to turn it off? Yeah. Then do flash again. I don't understand. There we go. Flashlight ah. off. Yeah, so now if off. you type it, if you type Chrome, it'll just launch Chrome and it'll also suggest the suggestions are really neat. Hey, but there you go. There it go. just launches the app. And yeah, it's basically it's a it's a command line launcher for your phone. Oh my goodness. It's amazing. Ron. So uh This yeah. is this so, is a return to form for Ron, by the way. This, this is this great. used to this be is, his beat. Yeah, and the thing is is that the thing is is that um if this was a gimmick, I wouldn't have brought it. But after using it for a day, the developer behind this really put a lot of thought into this and built in a lot of interesting hooks and commands. And just like the fact that you can use the calculator or you just type, you you know, if you typed call Ron Richards, it would just call me from your contacts. Don't do that because I don't know what, if it'll show my phone yeah, it might, it might But show um, it. But, it, you know, like it, it's really as if you're using the phone on a command line. And there's a lot of people who are, you know, who live and die by that command line. And I'm surprised it's taken this long to get a decent command line launcher for Android. But there it is, Linux CLI launcher. It's free in the Google Play Store. Uh, if you're crazy, join me. Let's go back to the command line. Enough of these icons. No so. doubt this is this is a <laughs> launcher unlike any launcher I've ever seen before. Yep. I've never seen a launcher like this, Ron. You did it. it it's very cool. Very, very cool. So. <laughs> Great job. Yep. Linux CLI launcher. Uh, check it out and see if this is your launcher, your l new launcher of choice. <laughs> I love it. I'm not sure it's mine, but I love that it exists. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you can appreciate it. I mean, you guys are you guys are more way more developer-y than me. Uh, would you want this to be your like would you want to live in the Linux world for your launcher? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the the terminal on the computer because it's faster for some of the things I do. Yeah. By no means is this going to be faster on my phone. <laughs> so no. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's awesome. All right, uh, Don, you are up next. All right, great. So I have a app here that I'm a huge fan of. It's called Aptive. And uh, Aptive is a application for fitness trainers or excuse me, for fitness. So if you're looking to basically get in shape, which uh, I'm very active in, in fitness and so forth, and a lot of people are wondering uh, how to get in shape and maybe they don't want to go to the gym 
or they've already gone to the gym, it doesn't work, or hey, you don't even have time, Aptiv is an app that allows you to do that. Now, the big deal is here, it's actually a, a subscription service, so you do have to, it is a paid app, it's not a free app. Uh, you can install it for free and check it out, but here I am logged into my account, and let's just say that you would like to start running maybe. They have a bunch of different programs that you can use here, and let's say I'll click outdoor running here, and they provide a bunch of different workouts. Now these workouts here range, if you see the little icons, they're red and green, and there's the yellow ones here. Red meaning it's gonna be difficult, green is easy, yellow is intermediate, and they each one of these workouts has a actual trainer behind it, and this is played with real popular music that you would hear on the radio right now. And so as soon as you start a workout, this one on the top here says run the world, it's 36 minutes long. As soon as you start playing it, you'll hear the trainer, Megan, come and say, all right, you're going to do a five-minute warm-up, start walking fast, and they walk you through every single bit of the workout just as if you had a trainer and you were at the gym. Nice. Uh, it makes it so much easier if you're by yourself, you want to go out and you want to work out somewhere. Um, if you want to do running, maybe you can't do running, maybe you have an elliptical machine at the gym and you want to have a trainer to do it, you can do it there. Uh, you can do elliptical. They have a whole bunch of different programs. Strength training, it's usually going to be body weight focused. Uh, cycling, stair climber, you don't want to do yoga, walking, stretching, meditation. And if you want to even get ready for a 5K, maybe you have that kind of goal, they can do marathon training as well. And they have like 30-day programs here. So if you want to run a, a 10K, you start with day one and just keep executing on down the list here. And you'll by the time you're at the end, you're going to be ready to run that 10K. So if you're interested in getting, getting some workouts in, this is a great app. Uh, they have different programs here uh, also at the top for maternity uh, quick hit workouts, and they also do ones that are trending currently inside of, of Aptiv. You can download them for offline usage and also view your stats as well. So again, if you're looking to get some uh, get a workout in or kind of start getting in shape, definitely give Aptiv a shot. Nice. So, okay, and it's a subscription-based It is service, subscription, right? yeah. So it's I think it's the monthly rate is $9.99 a month. So the way I like to look at it is a lot of people say, wow, $9.99 a month. Like, I don't know if I want to pay for pay for that. If you look at how much a trainer costs oh, yeah. per hour, they're like a hundred plus dollars yep. or 75, 80 dollars an hour. Yep. You can buy this once. You'll have a trainer every single day, multiple times a day if you want it for you know nine, ten bucks. Yeah, and it helps you kind of keep keep fresh, like you know, new workouts, yeah. change things up a little bit. That's really cool. Uh, so, that's a lot of people kind of offering offering these um, these workouts in there. That's well, yeah, cool. so they're all they're all curated too, and they're mm -hmm. all recorded in a professional studio just okay. like this mm -hmm. uh, with high-end mics, and they bring the trainers into the studios there, and they record them with a, with a DJ and everything like that. So everything is really top-notch. Everything nice. sounds great. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. And they're difficult too, so they're, it's, it's good for you. Nice. It's, it's pretty apt too. Yeah, apt yeah nice, I know. It looks designed. really nice. It's very nice design. Uh, Aptiv, A-A-P-T-I-V, if you want to check that out. And uh, get fit, active. Nice, nice pick. Uh, Mike, what do you have? All right. So um, I picked a game of sorts, although it's a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to turn the noise down for a second. Or I'll just leave it on for now. <clears throat> okay. The app I picked is called Father and Son, and it is a free app. Uh, no ads, no payment for it ever. It's actually an app that's written by the National Archaeological Museum in Naples, and it's kind of an app that's designed to um, kind of help you learn a little bit about ancient um, Italian artifacts and stuff. Um, so it's actually a really cool game, and when I was looking around at games, I wasn't really clear if like this was going to be it or whatever, but as I started playing it, I really got immersed in it, and I really just like enjoyed it. So um, basically all of this is a touch and uh, move game where you you know, move uh, this person around um, and you can look at different things. It's a really like slow moving game and really um, uh, has a lot of ambiance. But so the interesting thing is, um, so I've kind of walked around and started the game a lot. You walk around Naples, which is kind of fun. And you see all these really like stylized, artistically stylized um, artwork. But once you go into the museum, like I have now, you can actually switch between modern times and ancient times. So um, you're this guy uh, whose name is Michael, um, which I like. Hey, that's easy to remember. I know Don likes yeah. that. He's got a son named Michael. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, But basically the story is this guy Michael is uh, trying to learn about his father who died but used to work at the museum. Um, and so as he walks through the museum, he uncovers all sorts of interesting things about his father who was an archaeologist. Um, so it's actually a really emotional game and it's actually educational as well because you're learning about all these ancient artifacts. Um from the uh, National Archaeological Museum in Naples. Oh, nice. um, so one kind of nuanced problem, and we actually talked about a little bit before, is 
Some of the items in the game are only unlocked if you're on location at the museum in Naples. So um, I have seen where those happen a few places, um, but you could probably spoof your location when you got to those parts, <laughs> like we were talking about earlier. There we go. Um, All right. To, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's about it. It's actually a really like slow moving and kind of ambiotic game. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to play all the way through. Um, but it is actually really kind of neat and different. The artwork's beautiful. Yeah, I like um, the artwork. The experience is really like mellow and um, and it's really slow, you know. So it's like just kind of a chill, ambiotic, ambianced experience that uh, I really like got emotionally involved in and really actually enjoyed quite a bit. So Nice. Very immersive. Uh, yeah. That's really cool. The first game published by an archaeological uh, something. <laughs> I missed the last word. But it's by the, uh, but it's it's really by the museum. Cool first, okay. first Got it. Provide, created by an archaeological museum. That's really, I uh, love the art design on it. Yeah, it's it really, really pretty nice. and really um, striking. really unique and different, which yeah. is something I like to bring to the arena. Absolutely. Right on. So uh, go take a look for yourself and learn a little bit of something while you're playing a game. It's called Father and Son. And looks like that's free as well, right? Uh, totally free. Yeah, nice. Okay, um, mine, so there was a post a couple of weeks ago, more Android experiments have been kind of touted or promoted by by Google. And uh, I took a look at one, and I love this whole Android experiment thing. I'm sure they're going to have, they, they seem to do this every year at, at Google I.O. where they have a little section of the area devoted to Android experiments and Android powering really crazy cool things. The one that I picked out is called Camerata 3D Camera. And basically, so I'll show you here, it's kind of hard to explain, but essentially what it does is you need two devices. You don't need two devices, first of all. I could launch this on a single device and go into camera mode and I could take pictures you know, with just one device. But if I go into another device, launch camera mode, and I'm on the same Wi-Fi access point, they will search for each other, and once they connect, which they're doing right now, that is gonna allow me to sync up these cameras. Hopefully it works the first time. As you know with demonstrations, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, that allows, here, go, do it, do it, do it. That allows them to sync up to each other and essentially synchronize the, um, the camera abilities so that I can pair up the cameras on the back of the phone and take 3D pictures, depending on how, of course, it's not going to work because demo gods do this <laughs> when you are doing a show. Let's try it one more time. Live demo. I know. I got it to work in the office not, not too long ago. It says searching. It says syncing. There we go. Okay. So now that they're paired, it says put this device on the bottom and its camera on the right. Tap anywhere to continue. Yes. <laughs> put this device on the top, camera to the left. You'll know which one goes on the top because it has the actual camera control functions. So the my pixel is the one that does this. So how this is done, you can do this a number of ways. If I pair it like this, and I have to scoot it so that I can see through that display. Now you can see I've got the two cameras like that, right? They're a little offset. If only the cameras were kind of lined up perfectly, I'd probably get a, a little bit better of a, of a result. If I'm shooting something close to me, this is the configuration that I would want. If I'm shooting something that's like mid distance, they recommend you pop it around like this and you shoot like that. So you've got one camera over here, one camera over here. Mm -hmm. If I'm shooting like a landscape and I want 3D image out of it, I spread it out like this. Mm -hmm. But so we're in here. I'm not sure the best way to do it. I'm just going to keep it close for now because whatever, it's a demonstration. It doesn't matter. So I've got both cameras exposed. We'll go ahead and turn this over. It's hard to do this in a way that I can show it off. Um, so I'm holding both. You can see on the phone behind, it's just, you know, the video as well. They're synced. So what happens, and I'll get the cam, the cardboard viewer. I'm going to go ahead and go into picture mode. You can do video and photo, but I'm going into picture mode. I'm going to take a picture of this one. All right. So it'll take that picture. It gives me the little, the little preview down here if I tap into that. It says I can place it into a cardboard viewer, and there it is. There's the picture. Now, for whatever reason, it's not scrolling here. Let me pull it up on my other phone here. And it, sometimes I, I had very iffy kind of results on whether I was able to kind of move it around and have it track. 
So let me try this one more time. I'm going to do it with video instead. Maybe that will be better. So I switch it into video mode. Go ahead and do video camera. They're synced. Both of the cameras are feeding this information into the app in real time. I'm recording video as I do this. Probably for 3D, it would make more sense for me to have this mounted and have action happening in front of me instead of me moving the phone, but whatever. Okay, so it recorded it. Now you can see it's, it's processing in the background. I'll go ahead and tap that and pull that up, place it into the default, and now you can see like it moves around. If I was to put this into the cardboard viewer and look at it, these two images, you know, the one on the left and the one on the right, they were pulled from two different phones with the stereoscopic kind of uh, shooting, you know, ability synced through the app, I would see 3D. Let's see if it worked. Yeah, more or less. I could have synced it up. Oh, yep. Yeah, you know what? The cardboard thing was a little too close. Stuff a little bit further off in the distance. If you look beyond the cardboard thing that's too close, it kind of crosses your eyes because I think it was too close. But if you look yeah, down yeah. beyond... Yeah. It's totally a stereoscopic image. Like it syncs up the two yeah. cameras and creates a stereoscopic image. And I'm sure if you like took this outside, like in here, things are too close, mm -hmm. I think. But if I was to go outside and do this, you come up with some pretty convincing stereoscopic yeah, video, which is just kind of neat that you can do if you happen to have two phones lying around. It's called Camerata 3D Camera. And yeah, you stack two phones, create your own 3D images and 3D videos. That's cool. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, and only one near demo fail in, in the result. Came through at the end. It came through at the end. Uh, but it's very cool. Uh, definitely check it out if you like 3D images. So now it's time for you to vote for your favorite app of the week. Is it Linux CLI Launcher? Is it Aptiv? Is it Father and Son or Camerata 3D Camera? Bit.ly slash triple A vote 318. Bit.ly slash triple A vote 318. I'm doing a horrible job of remembering to go to the Google Plus community and pasting it in, it in there uh, before I leave home in the evening. But I'm going to try and remember to do that. I apologize to Google Plus uh, fans uh, for that. But place your vote, and we'll check in on it. What did you just vote for? Rons. Rons, of course. Uh, looks like it's probably going to be a pretty close one because these were all really interesting, cool apps. So we'll see how this all turns out. L the week's Linux show. launcher is the is the way to go, man. Text, <laughs> forget these icons. We're gonna command line all the way. <laughs> Everyone needs a command line launcher. It was it was about yeah. it's about time, really. The world yeah. needs a hero, essentially. Um, that's it for the pre IO episode. Always a lot of fun and so great to have you both along. Thanks for uh, making the two hour drive up from Petaluma in rush hour traffic. I'm really sorry. No. <laughs> Thank that you for having took us. that long. Thank you. Uh, Don, it's, it's a pleasure meeting you and having you on. Don Felker, of course, Google developer expert and uh, host, uh, co-host anyways, of the Fragmented Podcast. Tell people, like, what do you want people to know as far as like how they find all the stuff that you're working on, projects you're working on, all that kind of stuff? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is going to be through Twitter usually. And my mm -hmm. Twitter handle is at Don Felker. And uh, honestly, if you are interested in Android development or anything of that nature, please give the Fragmented Podcast a listen. We dive deep into a lot of topics, and uh, it's every week. So please right come on. check us out. Excellent. Good work on that show. That's I, I think uh, for developers, I mean, yes. you know, developers are thirsty for content that speaks their language, and mm -hmm. that's that's exactly what it's all about. So, uh, And then, of course, Mike, it's always great. Fifth year, always awesome having you up. Uh, tell people, well, we kind of know what you're working on. Yeah, you um, so I actually don't really have anything of myself own to promote, but I actually work on one of... Ke uh, Don's joints, which is called uh, caster.io, and it is mm -hmm. a um, right. Android instructional website uh, with really short, actionable videos. Um, it's not like some of the other um, training sites that have real long, um, real long courses and stuff. It's designed to be just like a minute or two, uh, up to five minutes, quick, actionable um, videos that you can watch. So I've recorded a bunch of videos about um, material design, implementing. Um, collapsible toolbar. Um, I just did a recycler view um, course. Anyway, um, I want to really suggest that people go to check out castro.io. And Don has actually set up a discount code that is for IO. It's good to the end of the month, I think May 30th. Yep. He's, uh, yep, um, so it'll give you a discount for your first three month subscription. 
uh, if you use the code IO2017. So oh, nice. caster.io and then the discount code is IO2017. So Thank perfect. You, That's rad. Caster.io for those courses. Uh, excellent stuff. That looks awesome. Cool. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, Ron, what you working on? Well, I'm working on not being jealous that I'm not going to Google I.O. Yeah, that's I for know. sure. I know. But uh, but I'm I'm very excited for all three of you and flow and everyone else is going and I'm going to be watching tomorrow and over the next couple of days, see how this stuff develops. But in the meantime, I'll work on my other podcasts. Uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times, I do a podcast called The Damn Fine Podcast with Tom Merritt, where we are rewatching and enjoying Twin Peaks. Uh, we have finished season two of Twin Peaks. You can go to damnfinepodcast.com and listen to all that fun stuff. And we've got an episode with Sarah Lane coming out on Thursday where we're talking about Fire Walk With Me, the Twin Peaks movie. And then starting this Sunday, Twin Peaks is back on TV on Showtime. And me and Tom Merritt and various guests will be back talking and breaking down the new episodes. I can't believe I'm actually in a world where we have new Twin Peaks content to talk about. <laughs> I know, right? So, yeah. So it's, it's amazing. Um, but then – if that's not enough, go over to ifanboy.com where you can listen to all the great podcasts where we talk about comic books as well as uh, comic book TVs and movies. We did our Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 review last week. That's out there. So you can check it out and hear how I wasn't really impressed by it. Uh, and we're going to be doing Wonder Woman in a couple weeks and things like that. So it's a fun time. So, uh, and follow me on Twitter at Ronixo where I'm tweeting all about that stuff. So you can all check it out there. That's awesome, man. It's got to feel good to get to the end of season two of uh, of Twin Peaks and also That's for feel sure. good for the fact that you've been looking forward to the new season of Twin Peaks for so long and now for suddenly since, it's just here. Since literally I was in middle school. That's how long <laughs> I've been looking forward to this. So it's going to be great. That's so yeah, awesome. no, this was is, a this long is, time ago. Yeah, I was going to say, this is not at all like the Star Wars prequels. This isn't something that I, I dreamed would happen one day. And, you know, uh, this is not at all like that at all. So it's going to be great. <laughs> not worried. Not worried one bit. Not worried at all? Uh, wait a minute. Not I detect something here. I detect a little <laughs> bit of something. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be great. Yeah, I'm sure you're because I, I imagine if it's not great, then you have to do a show where you talk about how not great it is. Yeah, I've, I'm I've sure done you a lot don't want to do that. I, I've done a lot of those shows where we talk about how things aren't great, and I would really prefer not to, but yeah. uh, we'll see. Uh, hopefully, I don't know. It's 18 hours of content directed by da written and directed by David Lynch. So I, don't I don't know how you how go that, wrong. How you can go wrong with that? Nah, yeah. So you don't. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Yep. The right people are working on on this uh, yep. Redux. So. <laughs> uh, what about you, Brian? Uh, I just want to mention that we'll be at me and Padre and I think Leo will be there for a little while. We'll be at Maker Fair on the, this Friday. So if you're in the area, stop by, come say hi. We get, we're going to have a few projects uh, laid out and show people and uh, just kind of hang out there. And uh, otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter at Cranky underscore Hippo. Fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, also Nate, uh, Nathan Oliveira's Giles is, is going to be there as well. So, yeah, nice, nice twit crew hanging out at the Maker Fair if you happen to be in the area. Uh, you can find me at jasonhowell.net or yellowgoldmusic.com. And that's about it for me. Also, Tech News Today, I do that show with Megan Maroney every weekday here at Twit. Um, but that's it for this week. We're going to go do some I.O. and then talk to you about it next week. Uh, leave us a voicemail, 347-SHOW-AAA, your thoughts about what you hear from this week at I.O., emails AAA at twit.tv or video mail if you want to get your face on the screen twitter we are at android show we have a subreddit at twitaaa.reddit.com show notes and past episodes of course twit.tv uh, twit slash aaa you can also find our episodes on youtube itunes pocket cast everywhere and you can catch us live every tuesday starting at around 5 30 p.m pacific at twit.tv slash live that's it for this week we'll see you next week on another episode of all about android bye everybody yeah.